Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, I think we'll get started here. We've got a, a good amount of people here already. Uh, thank you so much for attending the virtual book launch for Watershed, Attending to Body and Earth in Distress by Renee L Lenore Hansen. Uh, my name is Heather Skinner, and I am the Publicist and Assistant Marketing Manager at the University of Minnesota Press. The University of Minnesota Press is very honored to be Renee's publisher and we can't wait for you to hear our author and our wonderful group of uh, panelists tonight in celebration of the publication of Watershed. Uh, I have a few housekeeping items that I would like to get out of the way before we get started. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available after the event on the University of Minnesota Press's YouTube channel. Um, I'll post that in the chat, the link to that in the chat in a few minutes. Um, so you can watch it again or share with others post event. Um, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and uh, we have lots of great content there so please check it out. And if you need closed captioning, uh, we, you can turn that on at the bottom of your screen. There should be a CC or live transcript button uh, at the top or the bottom of, the, of your screen. If you click on it and then click either enable auto transcription or live transcript, that should start the closed captioning for you. Um, we have uh, plan to have time for viewer questions, of course. So please post your questions at any time in the Q&A window, uh, not the chat window, the Q&A window at the bottom or top of your screen. Um, please note that attendees can upvote questions in the Q&A function. So please make sure to use that, that nice uh, function um, so that we can answer the questions that um, most want to be uh, asked. So. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible in the course of the program. So um, please post those there. Um, and I'd like to now invite up Sarah Casavant from Subtext Bookstore, our partner bookseller for this evening. Uh, she can tell you a little bit, bit more about how to purchase a copy of Watershed from Subtext. Sarah. Hi everyone, welcome. We're so happy to be the bookseller for tonight's wonderful event. You can purchase Watershed, which I have right here, <laughs> uh, via subtextbooks.com. You can find it right on the homepage. You can also come into the bookstore. We're open for browsing. We offer in-store curbside pickup as well as shipping nationwide. So wherever you are, whatever your comfort level is, we can get you the book to you. I'm gonna also put the, the link in the chat function too, but um, it's just subtextbooks.com and you'll find it right there. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, now I'd like, like to introduce Christian Tweeden, uh, Associate editor, editor at the University of Minnesota Press and Renee's editor for Watershed to share a few words. Christian. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, just on behalf of the University of Minnesota Press, I just want to welcome everyone to this celebration of, of Renee's beautiful new book. Um, as an editor, I was, I was fortunate to get to work with Renee on Watershed, and, and from our very first meeting, it was very clear to me that this is a story that needs to be told. And um, we hadn't at that point entered uh, a global pandemic, but um, in the midst of a gathering like this tonight, even uh, from a distance, uh, this book and the community of stories that it embraces really does become all, all the more relevant. You know, one thing that I am continually inspired by is, is Renee's generosity as a teacher and a, a storyteller and a writer. Um, she's always looking for ways to lift up stories in the service of understanding. Um, stories uh, of her home watershed uh, on Minnow Lake in northern Minnesota begin the book, but it becomes very clear in reading that her story is um, one of many that are, are being told in this book. Um, so really in its intricate braiding together of these stories of climate and crisis from Minnesota and beyond, you know, Watershed is a very profound and useful resource. Um, it's one that offers a very intimate, deeply affecting look at our present moment. Um, it's really been a pleasure to play a small role in shaping what this book has become. And uh, it's been a joy to see it now out in the work, out in the world doing good work. Um, so at this point, I actually want to introduce um, tonight's moderator, Ula Nilsson, uh, engagement director at uh, mn350.org. Uh, Ula grew up in Minnesota, returned in 2011 after spending 20 years in California, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, since she became a mother and learned of climate change, Ula has worked passionately to help solve the climate puzzle and uncover the connections between racial, economic, and climate justice. As MN350's uh, 
first engagement director, Ula looks forward to helping MN350's continued efforts to grow, reach new communities, and effectively welcome the many people who are inspired to create better, create a better, healthier world together. Thanks, Christian. Um, lovely to be here with you all this evening. And I'm very honored to help uh, launch Renee's book into the world. I agree that it's uh, an important story to be told. Um, and <clears throat> I have known Renee uh, better since I moved back to Minneapolis in 2011. At that time, I had two young children and was fairly recently um, thinking about climate change and feeling very distressed. And Renee and I were able to connect and help encourage one another as we found our ways into the work that we needed to do um, and to really figure out how to be honest and bring our whole selves to that work. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciate about this book is that Renee brings both emotion and a very full range of human experience to a subject that in the past, at least when I started thinking about climate change, was very, it was a subject very much dominated by numbers and graphs. Um, so Renee being a teacher and knowing many people, she has very skillfully woven stories of her students, uh, of her own life, um, to show that climate change is not a future threat, that sometimes, you know, we, we talk about, um, climate change and how it's going to affect our grandchildren or our children, but that this is actually uh, a life-changing reality here in Minnesota and around the world. Um, so yeah, the, one of the things that um, Renee and I uh, talked about and held in common was the need to um, speak to our grief, to speak to our, our true feelings about climate and um, the way that Renee channels this in the book um, is similar to the way that Minnesota 350 started uh, 10 years ago. There were many people that were feeling very concerned um, and the power of their emotion brought folks together to search for a cure. So um, acting together, uh, that our organization has grown by leaps and bounds in the past 10 years. Well, we started out as a, an all-volunteer uh, just a group of folks trying to figure out what to do. And now we have, I think, close to 20 staff people and many projects all over the state. Um, so at this point, we are have uh, been able to advocate for clean, life-supporting jobs. We're supporting farmers to remove carbon from the atmosphere and moving Minnesota to clean energy at many levels. Um, and one of the, the things that I really liked in the book uh, was talking about Frederick Banting, the scientist who figured out how to isolate insulin and use it to cure diabetes. So, um, and Renee talks about him staying up late into the night. And I think there are many of us that spend sleepless nights thinking about, um, you know, how are we going to move forward caring for our loved ones and pushing for equitable and just solutions to this crisis. Um, and I, I know that Renee is, is one of those people. So with that, I am very honored to present Renee Hansen. There, I unmuted. Thank you, Ula. It's um, great to be with you in this. And yes, sometimes we stay up late in the night and I think of you and I think of others and we do the next day. Hey, everybody. It is very great to be with you all. I'm not going to introduce Ruth Ann and Steve yet, but I wonder if the two of you would also turn your cameras on. So I have a sense that there's someone to talk to. <laughs> I know all the rest of you are there and I love you and all that, but I can't see you. So it's nice to see Ula and Ruth Ann and Steve. Thank you. Um, we are in our places. Today was a beautiful day in Minnesota. It's becoming a beautiful evening. I want to welcome in all of your places that everybody's at and all of the birds outside your windows and the butterflies and your pets and the trees and the plants. You can open your windows. They're all part of this tonight. So welcome to all of them. Um, 
the land that nurtured my childhood and my youth was is territory of the Ojibwa. The college that I taught at and my home here in St. Paul lie on Dakota land. I'm grateful to these lands and I'm grateful to those many generations who cared for the land and who still are caring for it. And we join them and in our gratitude. Um, and I'm grateful to all of our ancestors from all the different directions. I ask them to be with us tonight as um, we bless my intentions and our words and our time together. Um, so I thank all of you who are here. Yeah, nice you're here. And I thank the U of M, very generous that they would publish this and subtext. These two places have many great books. Check them out, guys. Minnesota350.org. Uh, yeah, I'm on some teams with ULA as my leader. It's cool. The Science and Environmental Health Network, which has, it advocates for the precautionary principle that I would urge you to check out. Transition Town, All St. Anthony Park. These that I'm naming are all co-sponsors of tonight's event. Without Transition Town, All St. Anthony Park, my local Transition Town, but they're all over the world, I'm not sure I'd be able to do this. They are great. They've got my back. And so does the Sustainability Committee at Minneapolis College. We are a wonderful team to work together, and we will continue. I want to explain briefly why I wrote this book. Um, I loved writing when I was a kid, and I loved reading, and I started writing out of love of my land. That was mm, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, long back. And then I quit, pretty much, because of the demands of single parenting, which are steep, and of teaching at a community college, which are really steep. Uh, 30 credits a year is a lot. And um, I also realized that my voice as a white Minnesota woman was not so much needed. I had read a lot of books by women. And there were a lot of books that no one had time to read. So it seemed sort of silly to me. And then I met all these students that I was learning with at Minneapolis College, and they had stories I had never heard. They were um, native born, diverse populations. They were immigrants, refugees mostly. Um, and I, I didn't know what they were teaching me. And I thought that other people also needed to hear what, what they had to say. So I was pretty devoted to getting their voices out into the world. Uh, and then I have to admit, I fell into something like environmental and climate trauma when I realized what was happening to winter in my North Woods, and I was worried for my children and for my students and for my pine trees and birch trees and loons and the like. And that kind of silenced me. Um, it can be hard. I want to tell you all that if you face some of these things, like we're kind of in drought today, it looks a little cloudy. I keep hoping for rain, but we've got a drought filled Minnesota spring here. Farmers are wanting rain, and so are we woods people. Um, but then I got diabetes. Now, you wouldn't think that was a gift. I got type 1. I suddenly was in the hospital, and like they told me, I couldn't live without insulin. And then pretty soon, I couldn't live without my insulin pump, it seemed like. And then I was like a cyborg. And it was really odd and tough to suddenly, like, for most of human history and in most of the world, I would have died because I really can't live without insulin. And I had to decide if I was going to accept that and go on living. And I did. Partly because like insulin brought my blood sugar numbers down, I want to stick around and help bring the CO2 numbers down. And, and also the ocean acidification. I was deeply acidified when I went into the I see you and the ocean is and so we got to fix it. So I wanted to do that. Then students came to me saying you keep asking us to write, but you got to write too. And you got some privileges we don't have. It's true. I do. I got an education. I'm a lifelong Minnesotan. 
I got some privilege. I'm a white girl from up north. I got a loving family. I've always had food. And now I've got insulin. So they're right. And I realized how much I wanted to connect my family and friends in the rest of the world, especially in the rest of Minnesota with the folks I knew on, on campus. And I wanted to connect my students on campus with all the rest, because there are so many divides among us. It's really nice if we could talk across them more. Then I got some direct messages. My colleague Ty Coleman came to my office door and said, God told me to tell you to write about diabetes. And then my friend Julie Rista called me from a South Dakota uh, reservation, actually, saying, God told me last night that you should write about diabetes and climate and health justice. Hmm. And then Ula told me to write my climate story. So um, out of love for all of you. Oh, sorry, that's my insulin pump yelling. It does this. I can stop it. Yeah, out of love for all of you and my beautiful woods and the loons and all the children, all the children to come of the bluebirds and of us and of the pine trees. I did write it. And I'm going to read to you some of it. I say at the beginning that you can read, skip around, read here or there, anywhere you want. And you really can. But I think it also works to read it from the beginning to the end. Only you got to pause because you have to make the story your own. Um, I can be a forceful teacher. This is from the very end. I think it'll make sense, though. Chapter 17, Return, Spring. On my birthday, Dad fell. He was 90 years old. He had been overseeing the tilling of his garden. When he reached the house again and bent to turn off the hose, he fell. Boy, he called to Mom. Sweetheart, come help me up. Mom saw his shoulder blade sticking out sideways and told him to lie still. In the hospital, Dad asked me to look at his back. He had to be helped to lift his right side. The blood had pooled and turned black across the entire expanse. The green bruise was spreading. I knew he would soon die. He did not expect to go to heaven. He would wait resurrection. The October before, Dad and I had sat at the kitchen table and watched leaves fluttering down. He had said, hmm, the leaves fall, they decompose. Something new grows out of them. I think it might be like that. Something else grows out of our lives. We promised Dad that he could die at home, so we brought him to the lake in an ambulance. He moaned as the paramedics jostled the stretchers down, stretcher down the 34 stone steps he had laid to the door. We set up his bed in front of the window. We showed him the view of the lake. He attempted a smile. For four more hours he lived. Then, my brother Greg beside him, he let out the last of his breath. Summer. Dad had signed up to be cremated. He hadn't liked the idea. It would be harder for Jesus to collect all the parts when he returned if they had mostly gone up in smoke. However, Dad's was a God of miracles, and this would not be his last, his first, or last. So once the Cremation Society had done its work, Dad's urn, made by Greg of cedar wood from our lot at the lake, sat in front of the window facing the water. He, he was near the lake all summer as the water changed from quiet to wild, from white to black, from evening pink to morning beige. We would place him in the ground when the time was right. After dad died, worried for children and alarmed for all life, I took myself to the woods. Winding through the scrub poplar and hazel brush, trekking past drying fern, up and down the slight rises, I followed a path made by deer. I walked near the hollow where I had visited a wolf killed deer the winter before. Half a mile later, I arrived at the oldest white pine on that tract of land. 
It rose above the surrounding woods, nodding to the distant pines and the few tall spruce that stood out above the rest. I sat against it, leaning my back into its broad bark. It surprised me with movement. I looked up through the delicate lace of its needles far to the blue sky above. Mm, there was wind moving it. Coursing all the way down to the base, there were my back settled against it. Relaxing into its sway, I prayed to the tree, please take care of my daughter. I did not expect a reply, did not think the tree could hear me, assumed I was merely wishing. But I heard a reply. The tree said, if you will take care of mine. Now, pine cones open only during fire, and I knew that no fires had been allowed in these woods for the past 45 years. Therefore, this tree could not have a daughter. I stood up, unnerved. I walked away from the tree, pushing further into the brush, and then I was pulled up short by a blur of white pine needle. Just a little taller than I was, a young white pine stood, 40 feet from her mother, the daughter of the pine, struggling to grow amid a tangle of other thin trunks. I turned back to the old one. Yes, I said, I will take care of yours. When I return to the lake now, I consider what dad would say about the threats, the failing of winter, the possibility of a copper mine under the water. About climate change, I think he would be clear. God is stronger than man, he would say. After a pause, he'd consider and add, mm, and yet we can mess, we can make a mess of things, sure. Don't fret, Renee, he'd go on. God is still in control. Springtime and harvest, he, he's promised them to us. Remember Genesis 8, 22? While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. God spoke that to Noah, and God is still in control. I'm glad Dad won't be here when winter fully abandons his woods. About the copper mining, I think he'd just shake his head. Don't know about those big companies, he'd say. They just better do it right. We sure could use some good solar panels. Remember that first one I bought for the house? I hear they make them better now. That's that bit, and by the way, I have to tell you something that I've often said to my students. Do not believe everything you read. Don't believe everything your teacher says or your dad. Uh, I was wrong about pine cones. Because I've looked now and the roads are lined with baby white pines and there have been no fires. I say that in the notes. Um, yeah. Check it out yourself. Pay attention to your own senses and do a lot of research, you folks, because I might be wrong. And um, yeah, we need to find those things. I tell a lot of stories in the book from my students, but I can't, there wasn't any in that part. And, um, and I wasn't able to tell about all of our wonderful students. So we're gonna look now at a video from Amina Kynan. Amina couldn't be with us tonight, so she and I recorded and then it's, I shortened it. Amina came to my developmental writing class soon after she emigrated from Kenya. She's a Somali Kenyan. She was a nurse in Kenya. She thought life would be great in Minnesota and it was really hard. She couldn't be a nurse. She became a nursing assistant. And then thanks to Jamal, a really wonderful advisor we had at Minneapolis College, she ended up in my class. Uh, not only did she get through my class, insulin pump again, done. Um, but she got through it. She got her AA degree from Minneapolis College, MCTC at the time. She got her BS in nursing and then she got an MBA. Uh, she's run for parliament in Kenya. She's a supervisor in complex care management at Health Partners. She just does everything. She um, has been working these last months on remotely to help people in Somalia and Kenya deal with COVID. 
Um, Heather, Heather's here somewhere. Can you show us Amina's video? Meanwhile, y'all, put your your um, nearest water bodies or your indigenous people into the chat. Nobody's doing it. I'm working on it. One second. Okay, I'll keep nagging them then. Like I said, put your stuff in the chat, you guys. Somebody has to do it. There, Marie, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, when I started reading the book, I kind of related my childhood with your childhood. Every child, if they're blessed, they go through childhood. If we come to this age, you know, yeah. and you talked about the summer, the winter, the spring, whereby I grew up with one season. Mm -hmm. We didn't have winter and we didn't have summer. But again, somehow we kind of, you talked about mom and dad and grandma. We, I had that. Yeah. So we come from different worlds, but still again, there's this comparison, yes. compare and comparison, you know, there's some things we went through that I never saw, like lake, you know, we have rivers, we don't have lakes in my hometown actually we have lived in other part of the kenyan um, country but in my hometown we come from the northern part of kenya mm -hmm. desert yeah. temperatures are a hundred and four maybe three digits wow. always so for you talking about snow and all this and i'm like wow i saw snow in my adulthood well renee so the book it was kind of relating as a child and family and everything that I had, but in different world. Yes, right. Yeah. So yeah. I kind of paused and said, so the kid in Australia and the kid in way back in Somalia, they have this childhood, mm -hmm. but in different lifestyle. The drought affects our health. Mm -hmm. We bring it together because the, the drier the soil, we get dry too in our system. Yeah. It's the dry air. That's when we have the summer and you know, every kind of difference. So when I talk about health and the climate, they go hand in hand. Um, right now, because I am used in Minnesota, when I go home, I think I'm dying. I think I'm getting heat stroke, oh. you see? Mm -hmm. So that is, and what I tell people, they don't connect the two. Yeah, um, You can hear them complain about it's really humid today it's really sunny but again it's like how is it related with your health um and i liked when you talked about this one time i sat down and i i kind of flashed back and i'm like is renee talking about my home area because when you talked about your health and the experience with diabetes you know, you went through this phase and you ignored. Yes. You know, I did. so now you are an educated woman. You have all the necessities yeah. if you walk to the emergency room. But I imagine my aunt, my mother, my grandmother, she could, she will suffer until she goes to the grave. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we as women, we keep going. Mm hmm it's really nomad area because my family, you know, Somalis, and again, my family, we are pastoralists. We keep moving from one place to, and we are nomads looking mm -hmm. for green pasture. That's, that's how important it is for climate for us. So as we are searching for green pastures, including water, we have the animals also living with us. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's why you see, we have that passion. And my uncle decided to share the little water he had in a pan with his beautiful animal you yeah. know, without getting scared. So he, he was sensational through the internet and social media, you know, the mm -hmm. little he had, he had to share with another life. It yeah. doesn't have to be human being, but a life is a life. You say the word home and you mean Kenya. Yeah. Do you also say home for Minnesota? Yeah, I say home Minnesota. And you know, I read, um, I, in your book, I read one time you went to, Norway and when you said I kind of related with you because yeah. you are told no you are not Norway. this is not your home that's right yeah <laughs> yeah so I was like okay so it's not only us that you know I kind of felt that way because um and my son always struggle 
and when people say so where are you from he's born here and then yeah. and he says i'm I, I am from minnesota and say no but where are you from yeah. so so that's yeah. why i call home here too i you know although sometimes people don't accept right because and i have to explain when i say home I call, my home is Farmington and reading myself in that book because you talk about Saudi, Philippines, Mongolia, Somalia, Ethiopia, everywhere in the world. So I was kind of reading and traveling and like this little book kind of brought us together. Hmm. Can I, we do more? Yeah, I hope we can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, some things that I notice that I'd like you to notice related to Amina's is the question of who introduces new arrivals to the importance of seasons of winter in Minnesota. Do they know that the moose need cold? And who hears their stories of climate disruption at home? Do you all know that the Somalis came here because of climate change and drought? Um, how can we expect new arrivals to care for this land if they if they're treated as if they don't belong. I'm being a teacher, but I am. Amina said, and I didn't get this in there, that she really appreciated that I wrote about the original inhabitants. She said it gave her hope that I acknowledged that I also was an immigrant and that we together could honor the original people. So I'm going to introduce Ruth Ann Kripal Kim. Ruth Ann is a philosopher. She's my wonderful colleague at Minneapolis College. Um, she's a teacher of the year, and she's a leader in racial justice. Um, we get to learn, Ruthann, with these amazing people at the college. How, how can we use the, how can we take the power and the wisdom of our BIPOC and economically disadvantaged students and let that inform the ways that we use the privileges that we have? Thanks, Renee, for the question and for honoring this, our students. I think there's an important framework that I want to bring in here, and it's by the wonderful Bell Hooks, um, who writes that we need to think about education not as a banking system. Yeah. Where we are depositing knowledge, but we need to think about being exchangers of knowledge. And so I, I was just writing a section today where I was writing about amorous exchange that it is in love, um, in the body. And I think that's what you write about so well, Renee, is an embodied sense of love that honors time and place. And I think when we allow our students to teach us, then we hear a much more complex narrative of how climate is disrupting time and place, communities, and is affecting real bodies. And so these students contribute a marvelous mosaic of what is global climate disruption and how it can be agents of healing. Thank you, Ruth Ann. And I wanna welcome Steve Healy. Steve is a poet. He's my colleague at Minneapolis College. He teaches in, in the writing department. He's recently written a great book of poetry called Safe Houses I Have Known, which is about his relationship with his father. How do we, how we deal with the past? I'll let you say what it's about more, Steve. But Steve is now writing not just, sorry for that word, just, not purely poetry, but prose about his father, too, and his relationship with him. And, uh, you know, I really struggle, Steve, because my book doesn't have any clear form. It's not fiction. It's not science. It's, not, it's nothing. It's like all those things sort of mixed up. Um, how do we fit the pattern of our writing and our lives and what we've been trained about how, what writing is supposed to be and let it be in service to what our souls tell us we have to write? Wow, that's a good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I'm going to bounce it right back to you in a, in a few moments here, but um, thank you so much for having me, Renee. This is such an honor to be here. Um, I love this book. I just want to say first, this is a fantastic book. And for all of you who have not read it yet, uh, you have so much to look forward to. Uh, it's, it's a challenging book. It's, uh, it's provocative. There's all sorts of 
a space for uh, the sad and the scary. Uh, but it's also surprisingly to me um, so generous as well and so um, entertaining and readable. So uh, it, it does so many great things. Uh, so I, I give you uh, congrats for, for publishing this. From a poet, that's big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, that question is a really good question. Um, I know it's a good question because we've been, you and I have been poking and prodding at that for, for years now uh, on our walks and uh, around Como Lake and uh, lunch breaks uh, in Loring Park with the, uh, with the very aggressive uh, squirrels. Um, we've been talking about this mixing of forms and the crossing of literary boundaries. And I think it's a really good question, partly because it's so hard to answer because, and that's why we keep talking about it. Uh, and so I remember just recently uh, in a recent conversation and I was talking about my project, writing about my father who was a spy for the CIA uh, and, and changing from poetry to prose uh, and for two years now, I've been calling this a memoir. And then I just announced to you, or sort, sort of confessed to you, but wait a second, I might need to start calling this a novel, yeah. right? I'm not, because I'm not sure if it's actually a memoir or a novel, uh, but then maybe it doesn't matter what I call it, right? Yeah. And I feel like uh, you have said similar sorts of things about uh, the Watershed Project over the years, uh, something along the lines of, uh, well, I'm writing this thing, but I'm not sure what it is, or I'm not sure what to call it, or it's doing a lot of different things, and I'm not sure what category to put it in. So after reading the book, uh, I feel confident in saying that you figured out a way to make it work. And maybe uh, you can respond to this if you want. It seems like maybe you've accepted or embraced uh, the not knowing what to call it, or the not knowing um, what category to put it in. Uh, so, you know, if, almost on every page, you're mixing together uh, memoir, you know, of early childhood and, and of later in your life as a diabetes patient, uh, uh, as a daughter, uh, so forth. You're also doing literary journalism, you're, you're, you're doing the big picture um, exploration of environmental and racial justice, uh, political theory, you know, cultural criticism, uh, uh, really taking on the big questions. And one of my favorite layers is also a, what I would call a kind of self-help mode where you, um, off, you speak directly to, to the readers and offer this kind of gentle guidance, uh, you know, about uh, our emotional and physical well-being. Uh, so uh, you're doing a lot of different things and often it's happening on one page in these lightning quick transitions. And it's almost like you're saying, I don't care. I I'm just gonna jump around from one thing to another and it's just gonna have to be okay. Uh, so uh, one more little way of thinking about that, it seems to me, is uh, that you're wearing a lot of hats or, or, or taking on a lot of roles. Uh, in this book, you're, you're a, a parent, you're a college teacher, you're a diabetes patient, uh, you're an activist, you're an advocate, and all of those roles have different kind of rhetorical relationships to the uh, the reader. So I give the question back to you, Renee. Uh, tell us about how all of those forms came together. How did you weave the strands together? Uh, and how did that process evolve over time? It's a good question, Steve. <laughs> and thank you for all that. Um, as you talk, what I what I think about again is that we've really messed things up by dividing things into categories. And I'm pretty much opposed to categories. Like, it's okay for a little bit, but then you need to break them. 
Um, all of our words, words aren't anything, you know, they're just attempts to hold our thoughts. And we need to break those so that we can get to the actual thoughts and the actual reality of it. All the names, I mean, birch tree is not a birch tree. You have to break through birch tree to actually see the tree. So I don't think we should honor the forms. I think that they've ruined us and that we need to explore ways of breaking them down. So that if I've done that a little bit, then I am proud. That's good. <laughs> and about the different parts, what I you asked me this question in a different way the other day. And what I thought was that it's really connected to land. I wrote the different strands in different places. I wrote about the woods and the lake when I was up at the house at the lake. I wrote about diabetes here in St. Paul, near my endocrinologist and my hospital. I wrote about the student stories. Those are the hardest because they're the, the climate distress that they've gone through is really tough. Those were very painful. I wrote them at Mesa Refuge when I had a writing. Um, I was supported. They fed me. They gave me a place to stay and I could look out over the ocean and that made it easier to write them. I think I wrote the interactive assignments walking to campus. Um, so I ended up with like four books and they were a mess. And I went to Scott Edelstein, a great editor, and asked him, you know, should I just put this in a box or give it to my kids or what? He said, go home and braid them, which I love. It's like braiding sweet grass a little, you know? So I took a Thanksgiving break and there was no teaching for a couple of days and I cut them all up and laid them on a floor and then I put them together like a quilt or a braid. And they became beautiful in my eyes even the really hard parts. It, we need to take our, our trauma and our grief and um, make them beautiful or show, show what's beautiful and show our love. And that makes it a lot easier to do. So that's my response to that. Ruth Ann, you had a question for me. I do. And as a philosopher, I just have to celebrate the ability to mix, to break forms, to allow ambiguity, to allow a creative process to mm -hmm. unfold that reveals a weft and a fiber and a weave that I think has a lot of really rich um, cultural connotations to it. Yeah, but I wanted to ask you, because you and I, Renee, we share a background of having family who don't necessarily share our same inclusive perspectives. And I wanted to ask you how you continue living in the tension with community and family members who ignore climate trauma, deny its efficacy, and yet you remain a neighbor and a family member living in your integrity and your commitment to stay with people who are also your inheritance. Yes. How, tell us how you walk us. I, I love them. And I know they love me. And we speak different language sometimes. Um, not everybody speaks the climate language. It seems clear to me because I've read the science and it seems true. And I've watched what happened up north. I've, I've watched winter fade. This winter, the ice went out on our lake three weeks early for the first time in all of the, how old am I? All of the 60 years that we've been at the lake. It was three weeks early. This is hard. Um, but other people may use other words for it, but it's still hard for them. It may be weird weather. It may be end times. Whatever it is, it is our words for saying, this is hard. Um, and also that we love this land. We love our gardens. And we love our fields and we love our children and we love our the children of the bluebirds and, and the children of balloons and the eagles that eat the children of balloons. We like them all, you know, <laughs> and we'd like them to continue doing this. Um, we speak different languages, but I think we can listen to each other and know that the love is stronger and the love for life and for our children to have a chance at life on this earth is big too. Um, and then I have to tell you, I have a lot of other relatives. So when it's tough, um, 
my family and I, we all scatter and, and we go talk to our, our cousins, the trees. And we have the birds singing to us. And you know what? That possum that came in my yard, it knows that Minnesota is warmer. Didn't used to be here. The moose know that winter is not as cold as they liked it. And mm, I can stand and talk to them. You may all think I'm crazy. You know, I told you the tree talked to me. Well, I my ancestors were talked to by a lot of spirits. So, okay. The ones I hear are the ones I hear and you didn't hear them. That's fine. So you can say it didn't happen. But I spent a lot of time out with those other relatives of mine. And I've also got all these relatives here. So Marie's name, Maria's here. And so many of my um, community. So sometimes there are new um, there are new immigrants like the grasses up north. And I'm not happy about seeing them because it didn't used to be there. But I can say, hello, how are we going to get along? Can we leave room for blueberry plants? And now we should see, Ula, are there any questions or any comments from audience people? There are quite a few questions and comments. Um, and one of them that I thought was an interesting question, but we can get to some others as well is uh, for what classes do you think your book would be a good textbook? Mm. Mm. Uh, things that uh, talk about um, different populations in the US. I think any ethnic studies could be one place I'd like to see it. Um, and I know that people, science people are trying to say, how do we talk to common people about medical issues and about um, the connections, like Amina was saying, between dry climate and health issues. I think it, it can be a good case study for that kind of thing. And then I'd love if writing people take it on like, yeah, which course should this go into of those writing poetry or fiction or whatever? Well, That's I would add uh, creative nonfiction. Yes. Is, uh, it would be perfect for a book like this because it does so many things um, and just approaches nonfiction in such a innovative way. Yeah. I would like to use it in my environmental ethics class. Hmm, that would be nice. Hey, I wanted to tell you all that I make, a, I, I did a cartoon that then others developed for me. It's on my webpage because we wanted the book to stay inexpensive. So you might, I think the cartoon form is nice for showing this, the parallels between climate and diabetes. But Ula, any other questions or comments? Yeah, there's a question about um, how do we expose the trauma of the clear, clear cutting and the moose dying? How can we act for change addressing these atrocities in our own state? Yeah, it hurts your heart, doesn't it? When you see something that you love that is clear cut. Um, join with other people. It's too hard to do it alone. Like Ula said at the beginning, when you wake up in the middle of the night worrying about it, you have to remember the rest of us. We are together. I also wanted to say that um, there are lots of organizations you can join with and you don't have to just try one. There are many of them. All of those can work with you. And then you can come up with some brand new ways of your own. But first, weep about it a little. Um, I think if we don't feel the grief, we won't be able to act. Um, that's that's what I have to say at this moment about that. Um, there were a couple of comments that I thought were interesting. One was about um, breaking with breaking out of categories is something that also happens in music, and that mm -hmm. it's something that you know it's it's like the category of environment and economy and, you know, like part of the solution, not just uh, to talking about climate change in your book, but also to actually dealing with it is for us to break out of category. Um, and let's see, we have another, your book contains wisdom. How do you accept 
claim wisdom and share it. Well, I don't know. You each have to do that. This is a, the book is a call for you all to do what's yours to do. You see that um, embroidery on the back wall? I could bring it closer, but my daughter made that of the watersheds of Minnesota. Um, she's got this current genius of embroidery and she needs to bring that genius to whatever calls. And each of you need to bring your genius. Your and genius doesn't mean that you're perfect or brilliant. It means it's it's something in you that that wants to be expressed. So uh, express that. I may have lost the question in my answer, but um, we do this together, and you do it also together with all the things in your yard. All the they're not things. The beings, the bees and the irises coming soon here remind me did i miss the question um i think yeah i think you answered it there's a related question here about how can we introduce the narrative of your book into our conversation hmm. i don't know but i want you to tell me <laughs> reading it out loud is fun i love reading out loud so um, you can read out loud to each other and then you've got to write in the margins, write your own stories, your comments, your improvements all over it. You can write right on top of my words. Um, we're in this together, guys, just like, you know, the, the little amoeba in the earth and all of those roots of all the plants and then the robin beak that goes down into there. They're all together and they mess each other up. We can do that, too. And we need to make that living network to help the network of the earth that we've kind of strained. We didn't mean to, we didn't know we were doing it. Most of us, I think some of them did, but most of us didn't know um, that we were hurting things, but we can begin to heal. Do we have time for more questions or are we, what's, the, what's our time? We get one yeah. more at least. It's mm -hmm. you have six minutes. Yeah, I think we can take another question. There's a really good one from Jeannie Hill in the mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, um, you are so articulate about climate change and have a life full of experiences that brought you here. How can we encourage others to grasp the urgency of watersheds in Minnesota and come along more quickly? Good question, Jeannie. And I think you are, you are doing that. We each have to speak about it. Um, Minnesota said this before, but I'll tell you all doesn't get water from any place but the sky. And as many have said in the book, if we cut down all the trees, the rain doesn't come. We need this rain and we need this snow. And we, we need to catch it, not let it run off quickly. And we need to keep it clean because we got it from heaven really clean let's be um the messengers of clean water to the people in iowa and texas um talk about it we can talk about it and we can encourage each other yeah and any creative ideas you have follow them Um, oh, are we good? Are we done with questions? Take one more if you got another one in mind. Uh, there was one other question that I noticed about now that you're done with this fabulous book, what else are you working on? Oh, I'm I'm um, trying to restore the lake shore up at the lake. My dad didn't mean to, but he planted this horrible reed canary grass because he was a farmer, and it's going to ruin the sh it's ruining the shore. But I'm working on that first, and then we will see what the water and the new plantings tell me to do. Um, maybe it'll be right something, maybe it'll just be canoe more often. Uh, encourage all you to write, that's the important thing. Uh, yeah. 
I see that Mindy says, tell us about the title watershed. Watershed is about the watersheds of Minnesota. It's also about the watershed moment we're at because we got to deal with these crises of ocean acidification and climate disruption. Now, uh, we got a bit of time, but we have to do it now. And it's also about shedding water when you're a diabetic, because mm, you do when you don't know that you've got diabetes. We need to uh, pay attention to our bodies. Listening to your body, your own, your own body, and what it's saying is a really important part of this um, task we have ahead of us. Yeah, and we're on the path, we're here. And I thank you all, and I love you all for that. Yes. Heather. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending tonight. Um, it was a fantastic discussion with Renee and our wonderful panelists here. Um, I think if we can have Sarah come back on quickly to remind everybody how to order the book, that would be wonderful. Yes, yeah, so you can go to subtextbooks.com. It's right there on the homepage. You can search your watershed. Uh, you can also come into the bookstore. We're open Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 7, Sunday, 12 to 5. And we do in-store and curbside pickup, and we can ship nationwide. Thank you, Sarah. And just a reminder that there will be a recording of this event posted on the University of Minnesota Press's YouTube page um, in the coming days. And uh, I guess, Renee, any last words for our wonderful audience here? You're all so great. Um, so thank you all. And thanks to all those beings that keep you healthy, all your little microbes. Oh, if you have a good working pancreas that has good beta cells, say thank you. And if yours is kaput like mine, you can say thank you anyway. And remember to say thank you to the water when you drink it in the morning. Water, you know, is life and we've got to protect it. So we're on it, y'all. It's so great to see all of your names popping up down there. I love you. That's it. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. Night. Good night. Sleep well, y'all.